We don't even know what a species is, for heaven's sakes. Two creatures are not members of the same species if they're both perfectly fertile but can't produce fertile offspring. To wit, donkeys aren't the same species as horses. Although they can have a baby mule with the horse, mules are sterile. If the organisms reproduce asexually, their DNA or RNA is compared. A room full of smoke? That certainly wasn't what I was hearing from prominent Darwinists like Richard Dawkins. Evolution is a fact. It's a fact which is established as securely as essentially any other fact that we have in science. Richard Dawkins is so confident that evolution is a fact and that therefore God doesn't exist. Mr. Stein, you have misunderstood Professor Dawkins. His lack of a belief in a deity stems from a lack of evidence for one, not from the presence of an alternative explanation. The fact of the matter is, even if, and I am speaking hypothetically here, even if evolution were completely falsified, even if we somehow found evidence that the various species do not share descent from a common ancestor, Richard Dawkins would still be skeptical of a god. Why? Lack of evidence for one. Evolution has nothing to do with Dawkins' religious beliefs. He teaches people evolution because it's science, and it does have evidence behind it. Science is the systemic accumulation of knowledge of the perceivable universe. By teaching it, he gives people a better understanding of the world they live in. Essentially, he's helping people. I'm an atheist with respect to the Judeo-Christian God because there is not a shred of evidence in favor of the Judeo-Christian God. Thank you, Professor Dawkins. It is, it is completely right to say that since the evidence for evolution is so absolutely, totally overwhelming, nobody who looks at it could possibly doubt that if they were sane uh, and not stupid. So the only remaining possibility is that they're ignorant, and, the most, and most people who don't believe in evolution are indeed ignorant. But the people I spoke with weren't ignorant. Mr. Stein, I'm afraid they are. Ignorance and stupidity are not synonymous. One can be very smart and use their intelligence to create an ingenious argument validating ignorance. Your sources are ignorant. They are ignorant of early Earth atmospheric conditions. They are ignorant of simple mathematic functions. And they use that ignorance to justify actions that only serve to perpetuate this ignorance. Most of your sources have been given the facts they choose to ignore again and again. And some of them have actually proven themselves wrong, but still make claims to the contrary. You may wonder why I flashed the picture of Michael Behe at the end there. See, he ran a simulation to prove that evolution of complex systems can't happen. Despite stacking the odds against it, his sim showed that the complex systems required in his simulators could have evolved in about 20,000 years. He was eventually forced to admit this in court. Despite the fact that Ken Miller disemboweled irreducible complexity in the Dover trial, Behe still defends it. See, Behe argues that the flagellum is irreducibly complex because if you remove a part from it, it's no longer a working flagellum. Ken Miller showed that if you remove most of the pieces from the flagellum, it functioned as a type 3 secretory syringe. This is seen in nature in several cells, like say, you're seeing a pestis. Nasty little bugger. Cause the pneumonic, septicemic, and bubonic plagues. See, because all those parts were removed, it's not irreducibly complex because it can be reduced, right? Well, Behe's got a new line of defense. He now states that the flagellum is irreducibly complex because even though Miller did remove 40 of 50 proteins and wind up with a working mechanism, Miller didn't remove them one at a time. See, evolution works with gradual steps. 40 proteins is a big jump. Well, let's look at the entire evolution of the flagellum step by step. This model was made by Nicholas J. Matsky. The animation is by CDK007. We start off with a simple pore. These are rather necessary for organisms with phospholipid bilayers, so they probably evolved right around the time organisms stopped using fatty acid bilayers. Phospholipid bilayers are far less permeable than fatty acid ones. Then we add proteins to make that pore selective. 
They probably popped up shortly after the first pores formed. ATP synthase present in chloroplasts has two groups, F1 and F0. I'm afraid the animation is incorrect on this last point. It shows both groups being used in the type 3 mechanism. As it turns out, it only uses part of the ATP synthase, the F0 group. I think CDK007 was shooting for simplicity here. In any case, the F0 group of an ATP synthase binds up with the pore, allowing it to pump things into the bacterial membrane. Next we have secretins. They pump things from the membrane to outside of the bacteria. So if we take our pore, which pumps proteins into the bacterial membrane, and we attach it to a secretin, the bacteria can now pump proteins into its surroundings. This is the type 3 mechanism. Cute, huh? Now, let's start building our flagellum. Remember, we have to go step by step, so let's start small. Let's have our bacteria secrete something sticky. So why would it do that? Well, if it finds a good environment, it would be advantageous for the cell to stick around. So that's what it does. You see, since we haven't built a flagellum yet, the bacteria falls victim to whatever current comes its way. Think of it as Spider-Man. When Spider-Man's falling, he shoots a web, attaching himself to a building. Now let's keep thinking of Spider-Man. Being able to shoot his web out from 50 feet away is better than being able to shoot it from 5 feet away. So it's better if the sticky thing is longer. Natural selection will favor longer sticky secretions, longer web lines, fewer fallen spideys. So, our sticky proteins attach to one another and form a pilus. Now, which do you think is better, to hold the line in his fingertips or in a closed fist? Naturally, he'll fall less if he has a good grip. So, our pilus, little by little, moves down the secretin and attaches to the original pore protein. Now, something very interesting happens. A topol system found in bacteria today attaches to the original pore protein, causing it and the pilus attached to it to turn. A flagellum, kind of, at last. That one step shifted its behavior and therefore purpose. The bacteria can now escape an environment when food is low. This is an absolutely revolutionary change. Signal transduction proteins attach to it, allowing the cell to tell it when to spin and when not to. More tall pile systems attach, speeding up the rate of rotation. The secretin detaches from its chaperone proteins, allowing the flagellum to spin freely. What's left of the secretin is modified into the P-ring, which acts as a bearing for the flagellum, allowing it to spin even faster. The chaperones become the F-ring, another bearing structure. And, uh, voila, we have our flagellum. See, we see shifts in purpose in nature all the time. Take feathers. Baby chicks are born with downy feathers. They don't fly. So why feathers at all? The down acts as an insulator, keeping the chick warm. So what does this mean? Well, feathers may not have begun as a means for flying. Perhaps it began as a way to keep warm, like the fur of some animals. How does Darwin, or, or Darwinism, say that life began? Well, he didn't know, and in fact, nobody knows. Technically true. Many valid hypotheses exist. We're not sure which one is right. Well, how can there be a theory about life without a theory about how life began. How can there be a theory about gravity if it doesn't explain quantum mechanics? The answer is simple. Separate phenomena, separate explanations. Provided two theories regarding separate phenomena are not contradictory, they can both be true. This is the story of a small planet in space called Earth. For a typical Darwinian explanation of how life originated, Dr. Wells directed me toward this documentary. The chemical elements essential for life, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, were now in place. What was needed was a way of combining them. Perhaps the energy came from lightning. Whatever it was, 